Talk Live program. Uh, it's an honor, as always, brother. I'm so proud of you and your success. We've known each other for a long time. And uh, so welcome. Thank you, man. I'm honored to be on this platform with you guys. You know, I'm proud of what, you know, y'all came together and, and began to build, you know, which is this museum, which honors, you know, the, the artist, you know, and I, I love it, man. I love it. Yeah, it, it's, 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 well, you know, we're all building on, on this history and uh, you've been an important part of that. So I've, I've got a presentation with you tonight. We've got a lot to catch up on. I've got some things okay. to learn that I didn't know about you uh, okay. as, as, as well as others. So I'm going to just read a, a bit about you from your, your bio uh, and um, share some of that with folks. Um, in the early days of hip hop, a graffiti artist from New York known as Sure King Fade created a following with his custom airbrush shirts. In the 80s, Edwin Fade Sakasa transferred his passion for graffiti from the surface of trains to the surface of t-shirts. Fabric became his new canvas, and soon enough, Sure King Fade, along with his partners, the Sure Kings, transferred, transferred street culture and street art into clothing, becoming the first to commercialize their graffiti. Some say this was the birth of the streetwear concept. Customation was the hallmark of the shirt kings. For every piece and customer, the graffiti was custom made, always painted with airbrush, the shirt king style, which is immediately recognizable. Remixing pop culture elements and icons, we see Mickey Mouse sporting gold chains while smoking and Pink Panther reclining on a champagne bottle and more. Through their vision, cartoons became badass as, and as a part of the foundation of graffiti streetwear. Uh, you've opened a store in Queens at the Coliseum Mall, uh, which became iconic in the hip hop scene in the same way Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren's sex shop was to the punk scene. Mm. Some of hip hop's biggest stars began passing through your doors uh, from the likes of Jay-Z, Jam Master Jay and RZA. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there because you have a lot to share. You, you okay. have covered a lot of ground um, even just as before you became the shirt king, you were you were someone. Let's let's go there. Let's talk about uh, a bit about you because um, from what I've learned is that you you you're really from East. You, you were born in East East New York, Brooklyn, yes. but then moved moved to the Bronx at a very young age. Yes. Um, so you you in a way uh, really got kind of got to see the true birth of hip hop. And you know, Definitely. from Brooklyn to the Bronx. Definitely. Definitely. Um, you know, I, I, I had I had the opportunity to to come to the Bronx at a ripe age, you know, like eight years old. And, you know, when we got to the Bronx, my brother, you know, he submerged his his self into the culture. And it was a culture that wasn't going on anywhere else in the city. It was like, it was just in the Bronx, you know? And he would come home doing different things. Like one week he was break dancing, another week he was, you know, he'd had some kind of mixtape or, you know, but the thing that struck me the most was him being a graph writer. And, you know, he used to tag up Fly One, INDS, the independence. Um, and a whole bunch of dudes used to come to the projects and, you know, be at our house and drawing in black books. And, you know, I never understood what was going on, but I saw that they had a passion for it. And I saw that they were having fun. Like they would, you know, when we moved, where we moved at in the Bronx, it was on Gun Hill Road on the five train. So the layups, you know, where they would house the trains and people would go and paint on them were like one stop away. So it made it easy for my brother and whoever else, you know, to connect and then they'll go to the to the train yards or go to the layups and then come back. So I would see them on the comeback. I would see them in the morning counting cans, leave, and then come back running and have paint all over them. So that was like super inspirational to me, but I had no idea what, what they were doing at the time, you know? 
you know, what I find interesting is that you were right there on Gun Hill, uh, uh, you, you know, where T Connection was. And that was yeah. a, the famous club for hip hop and the early B-boys would go up there to battle. Um, yeah. And there's this amazing layup, platform layup <laughs> that's right yeah. there. Well, I mean, that came later because we didn't move to White Plains Road until about eight years later or so. Well, about six years later, we moved to White Plains Road on that side. Mm -hmm. But the side we were primarily on were, was the, uh, the Co-op City, East Chester Projects, Boston Road side. And, you know, I emphasize that because, you know, DJ Breakout lived on Boston Road. And, you know, he had the group Funky 4 Plus 1. And so I had the opportunity also to, like, sneak up there to Boston Road, you know, as a little kid and go peek in, in Breakout's uh, basement and see Raheem and Shah Rock and all of them practicing and harmonizing and, and taking their craft, you know, to another level, you know? they It was like they were the four tops. Like, they was practicing routines, and Raheem was like, yo, y'all got to sing it like this. And, you know, K.K. Rockwell and Keith, Keith, you know, Caesar, and they were just like in harmony, you know? So I think that kind of worked on me too, like being able to envision, you know, bits and pieces of hip hop here and there, you know? And so were you just primarily thinking about writing when you were a kid or, or did you think like, well, maybe I could be an MC or be, you, you know, of course you were trying to be boy, but DJ, <laughs> anything outside of the, of, of graph? I mean, I, I tried all the elements. But it was more of a natural evolution, you know, because when I lived in Brooklyn, you know, my moms would get me those Disney books and stuff. And then my brother was like a big, you know, Marvel comic book reader. So I started, you know, basically reading the comic books and stuff. So when we got to the Bronx, it kind of made sense to, to, to start off with the graph because you know, we were seeing like the, the crazy five, like Cratchy and, and Def and, and, you know, all those guys and they were drawing comic book characters, you know? And, and, and I'm like, wow, these are the same comics that I'm reading. You know, I remember somebody had like a Beetle Bailey on there and, you know, and that's from the Sunday times, you know, the Sunday morning paper. So I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. So, you know, it was just like a, a natural evolution just to get into the, the graph part of it because, it seemed like the, the the writers knew what was up, you know? Like, everybody didn't read the funnies, you know? Everybody didn't read or collect Marvel comic books. So it was kind of like the, the writers had some kind of inside information, and this this what drew me, and I was like, I, I need to know what this is all about. And then, you know, watching my brother also, you know, that, that kind of just like, wow, like, you know, your notoriety is growing, but then he got out of it, and went on to another phase of hip hop, you know. What did where, where did he go from there? Um, mostly like dancing. Um, right. I don't think he tried the DJing thing, you know. Then he just just went into the, basically just the streets, just you know being a part of whatever was going on in the streets, you know, especially like going to the parties, you know just being part of that whole atmosphere and then dragging me along. So I was able to experience like seeing red alert at, at a Vander Childs high school where I'm not even in high school yet, but I'm able to go and see him, you know, because of my brother's notoriety in the street and then going to the T connection and seeing stuff going on when I'm 14 and I'm not supposed to be in a T connection. You I know? was just going to go there with you. You, you yeah. were pretty young to be in T connection. Yeah. But yeah, many of us could get away with that back then. Well, I'm saying you, you, you know, you know, moms is like, take your little brother. And she doesn't know that he's going to the T connection. So it's like, just take him. And I'm like, Oh, this so for is where people we're going? that don't know, name some of the great groups that that were were in the house at T Connection in that era. Definitely the Zulu Nation, um, Bambada, Funky Four Plus One. Uh, when I mean the Zulu Nation, I mean like the whole like the, like you have different sections that are just come by themselves. You might just have Mario 
by himself, you know, and the Chuck City crew. You know, you might have another section of Zulu come, you know. Um, but Funky 4 plus 1, uh, I never seen Flash there. I saw Flash in the, in the Valley Park. He came, and that was like a big event, you know. You had to realize that these guys were became our superheroes at the time, you know. And I, I asked Raheem about the dress code. Like, why, why did you start wearing leathers and all of this? Because he said they... They wanted to be rock stars. That was their form of being a rock star. And, and it made so much sense, you know? To, to have a look. But uh, one of the other things, too, is that, you, you know, you were down for the risk. Uh, I, I, I see this picture of you climbing down the side of an L. Um, yeah. And and that's that's real. That's part of the journey of of train riding, and it's it's the risk. It's, it sometimes it's not just if you could do a burner, uh, yeah. or if you could do a throw up. If you can get away with something, it's the risk. It's the um adrenaline rush that you get. You know, when I seen my my brother and his whole team, you know, and they always had Kathy with them. She used to write cat. Uh, I can't remember what, like Cat 161 or whatever. I don't know. But it was always like two, three girls, and they all were getting down. But it was just seeing them come back, and they were just all laughing, like, yo, did you see Did you see that officer slip? And, you know, so I was like, man, I need I need to find out what this is all about, you know. And in that picture, that's the New, new Lots Yard. And for those don't know, that don't really know that I'm actually like 40 feet in the air in that picture, you know. And, you know, you train yourself how to climb up the pole and how to, you know, come down, you know, in case of emergency, you know. In case you're being chased by cops, you mean. Yeah, they're not going to do what we're, we're going to do. For sure. You know? yeah. For sure. Yeah, definitely. Climb down a pole 40 feet in the air down to the ground, you know. I, I mean, great risk to paint trains, right, and to get your name up. I mean, what, why did you want to get your name up? What, what was it about graffiti that you felt? Aside from everybody doing it, at what point did you realize you were going to be very serious about your talents? When I saw people in my projects who start started to notice the name, you know, at first they just saw me like as a vandal, you know, and just tagging up everywhere. But when they saw it on the train, you know, and then they saw it, they said, man, I saw something. I couldn't read it, but... It, it looked like your name, you know, and that kind of pushed me on because they, they showed an appreciation of it. And then one of my cousins in Brooklyn would see a piece and would, you know, call me and be like, yo, is that you? So it was like, wow, like New York City has actually given me a platform. They've given me a canvas that's going to roll from the Bronx all the way to Manhattan, all the way to Brooklyn. You know, I'm going through major neighborhoods you know, with my with my artwork. So it was more of exposing the culture because I got exposed to the culture. So I said, they got, I got to figure out a way for people to see what we're doing, you know, in our community, you know? Well, one of the things too is if this particular piece is, is mentioned and made famous in Style Wars, this is the one where seeing, seeing TC5 uh, speaks about Cap going over the Fat Albert. Yeah. It's an infamous piece, and here it is. Yeah, man. Cap is my boy. Really? So fill, fill me in on that story. Well, um, this, is, this, is, this is a time period when, you know, I felt graffiti was something you did as a rites of passage. So at 16 years old, I decided that, okay, I'm going to, like, stop writing and I'm going to do what we're supposed to do, like go to college and, and do those kind of things. And seen and I forgot who else might have been those. They came to the house and was like, yo, you need to come and get down one more time. So this was after, you know, I quit. I quit writing, you know, and they, they came through. And, and so we did the Fat Albert, you know, I was an avid Fat Albert fan and, and you know, the little cartoon B and Stinger and, and all, you know, I just, I was just, and I said, this is my time to do a Fat Albert piece. And it rolled out for a couple of weeks. And then, um, seeing them were in a war with MPC crew at the time. And this is 
the cart that that cap caught and i had wrote peace you know because i was like getting into my spirituality side and like you know so yeah it's about peace and he put war on top of it you know he just put a, a line through my name but i think he just devastated you know scene's name and i was like wow okay like but you know i was like he doesn't even understand what i can and if i came back what I will be capable of, you know, because New York City trains you to be a, a street soldier, you know. But I, I, just, I just left it alone because I felt it wasn't worth. You kept you know. your, you know, you mentioned the cartoons, and again, this early fade piece with the Scooby Doo. Again, this is one of the things that's a recurring theme with writers is the influence of comic books, the influence of television. Well, if you look back, for me, I believe our side of hip hop, which is the, the visual side, a lot of it for me was influenced by Marvel, you know, influenced by Peter Max, like the colors of Peter Max, you know, that he used those psychedelic colors from the sixties, you know, my mother bought me a towel when I was a kid and I used to just stare at that towel. Like, I was like, wow. And so when I saw the graph, you know, it kind of reminded me of that, that style, you know, and so it was kind of like, okay, I'm going to mesh the, the Marvel comic books with, with Peter Max style. And that's what I believe, you know, early graph was, you know, arrows and stars and, you know. And so a, a lot of your training too, you know, a lot of your development too happened at Art and Design. Uh, oh, we, we're yeah. both alumni to Art and Design. We have strong feelings about that school and its history. Man. Uh, tell, tell me about art and design and, and when you first got there. Man, art and design was major, major for not only for kids in New York City, you know, it was located in, Man in Manhattan, in Midtown Manhattan. So it was to us, it was kind of like prestigious to have to travel to go to school. You know, you had to get an entrance exam. You know, so that was that school was like beyond training. It was like the the like going to the Shaolin Temple and learning from the from the greats. Cause when I got there, the greats were there. You know, they they you know Flint Flint was there. Flint Double O Seven Flint Seven O Seven. Um, Aztec was around. He wasn't there anymore, but he he was you know still in the vicinity you know you had gene 13 um you had zax one who was king of the king of the broadway at one point um uh and the way i got to that school is that uh one of my 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 elders he used he used to be a casanova and he lived in uh in patterson project so he was under like the grandmaster flash tutelage and everything and he moved into my building you know, so that kind of where his attitude towards hip hop, it solidified who I wanted to be in hip hop. The, the dude was a, a an amazing B-boy. So I picked up stuff from him, you know, and by default, I found out he was a graph writer. You know, he was a DJ also. So I used to go up there and like search through records for him and stuff like that, you know, be his record boy. And one day I found a black book. When I found the black book, he just like, like, yo, yo, you don't look through that. Don't look through that. You know, so he was letting me know the outlaw part of it. Like he wanted to be anonymous. Like I moved away from that. I don't want nobody to know I'm chaos one, the king of the six trains, you know? Wow. Yeah. And so that's why I did like a couple yeah, of Yeah, I know who you're talking about because I was a six line writer. Oh, wow. So, you yeah. know, you've seen yeah. it under with, with the Ken Do and, you know. That's right. From that six era. Boys. Yeah. 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 The Six Boys. Yeah. And he was from, from Patterson. So. That's my neighborhood right there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Salute. So he's the guy that said him and Dr. Rock. Dr. Rock was from Boston Road. And they both went to art and design. And, you know, they had the acrylic going down the pants. That's where I got it from those two. And they was like, you need to go to art and design. Just just drop everything and go to art and design. And they both forced me to go. They was like, take the test, bro. You know, you're going to How did you prepare it. your portfolio? Did they help you with that? 
Uh, well, they gave me pointers, but the the um my art teacher in 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 high school pretty much said, you know, I can help you, you know. And I, I had a lot of drawings, so you know, the teacher kind of said, this is good, this is good, this is good. Don't bring this, you know. And I was I was pretty pretty decent uh Disney draw, you know. That was my 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 intentions to become, you know, uh, uh an animator, you know. But um. When I got to art design, you know, there was so many amazing artists there, you know, not just graph writers. Like one of the guys in my in my in my homeroom, um, Serge Eisenberg, lived next door to Yoko Ono and John. And they were commissioning this guy at 13 years old to do portraits. So I was like, you know what? I'm I'm out of I'm not even doing art. I'm going to the to the, you know, to the photography department and I opted out because I'm like, this dude's already doing stuff for, for John Lennon, you know, uh, where do I fit in that? So that's how I got the camera in my hand, you know? And so you were stay by the time you got to art and design, you were already a writer. You were already thinking about, Well, know. I was a toy. I was a toy when I got the art and design, you know? So I, who was influencing you at art and design? What, what writers, that you would, you know, work because you started out with TNT crew, which is a crew from my neighborhood. That's uh, LC, right? And Q back yeah. in the days. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so uh, TNT grew from, you know, uh, a small two man crew into a bigger crew and you were part of them. And then you became yeah. part of TFP, uh, which yeah. is Case, who lived in Jackson yeah. Projects, who was yeah. very close to me as well. Um, I, in art and design at that period, um, I, I think when I got to art and design, you were probably already a senior, but um, uh, possibly, right? No, you guys came, I think, all in 10th grade. I was, yeah. y'all came in 10th, I was in 11th. 11th grade. Yeah. And so this whole community of, of artists that were already there is really interesting because it's all, that school's always had like this mythic story around all these great writers that went there. Well, um, for for me, uh, I had like several different influences. You know, uh, one of my my homies in East Chester, his cousin was was a dope writer named Track Two, and he was from the Four Train, and he was king of the buses at one time. So, you know, me and him kind of partnered, and uh, Pacer One, Pacer One, who eventually became a CIA member, also. Uh, you know, Pacer was officially my first bombing partner. And we used to bump heads with Q and LC, you know, because they would be uptown. Q lived uptown on the two train. So it was a battle of whoever gets up earlier is going to get these fresh carts. And we just kept bumping heads like, man, they got here before us or we got there before them. So eventually we ran into each other and we just like, you know, we joined on the T TNT, you know, and Slay, um, Slay One from Gun Hill Projects, you know, he created TNT, which was the Nasty Two, and um, Q and LC, they just took it, you know, and then from there, they made me, you know, the prayers of TNT, you know, once they quit. But we had a nice little knit team together and was bombing together when and I then, got the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then eventually you, you would add agents and scheme to that to that roster, right? Oh, definitely. Definitely. That came that came as a progression, you know, as as what I did with TNT was was take it uh all city, you know, because of my my Brooklyn roots, you know, there were writers in Brooklyn that like Tank and Seep, you know, Seep was also TMT and TNT, you know, I had my boy from East New York and and, and also an alumni of art and design Deck D E K, Deck T B C, you know, he was affiliated with Two Swift and App, you know. So that was, we were we were the team in East New York. Then we had the team in Queens, you know. We had Cedric, we had Say Say Adams, you know. So uh, I just had this thing of not just keeping it in the Bronx and just keeping it in the Bronx crew. We got to get people from Staten Island, from you know, from everywhere and make this a, a, a real, you know, plus we had challenges, you know, we had TMT, so we had to be 
bigger than them. And yeah, well, you also had to deal with CIA and 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 yeah. TKA and Rock and uh, oh, you, uh, Mafia and Out to Bomb and <laughs> so many great crews. Definitely, but, but yeah. more importantly, I, I think most infamously, uh, when you connected with uh, Rest His Soul, Brother Case, Ooh. Case Two. Oh my goodness, that was a a big necessity. You know, you got to think of uh, an army captain or a general just sitting there thinking how can we beat TMT? They got Chain 3. Chain 3 is affiliated with TDS, the Def Squad. These boys is blazing the one train and then it's spilling over to the whole and everybody wasn't really in that. They didn't understand that TDS style but we did and we was like how can we compete? We, you know, we want to come from just being inside bombers to, you know, being that way and lo and behold man like i met case like i heard so many stories about him i heard he was retired you know i was 14 years old and i seen him at the bench and i was like yo you know like i'm hearing about you that or that you know oh yeah what you write shorty Faye? oh that's a cool name sounds like phase two you know but you know i'm better than phase two and you know he, he was that type <laughs> of dude <laughs> you know and um and and man, he just took on to me. And one day, you know, Q called me and was like, yo, I got a present from you from Case. And I was like, like, what would Case be giving me? And I went to Q's house and it was an outline. And I was like, yo, this dude sat down and made me an outline? Like, like I, Case really believed in me, you know? And so I started, like, going to more houses and hanging out with him and I mean, that's how I was able now to get into Harlem World Club. You know, I seen the Busy B, Kumo D battle with Case and the whole Morehouse crew. You know, we were wow. there, you know, because Busy B was part of the Morehouse because AJ was his DJ and AJ lived across the street from Morehouses. So, you know, all this is, is going on. And then on top of that, you know, Case's legend of the one arm, you know, so... I'm hanging out with him, sleeping at his crib, everything, man. Not even going Would he home. talk to you about his partnership with Butch? Oh, yeah. Butch was Did in he? jail at the time. So yeah. we were waiting. We were like awaiting for Butch to come home, you know? Yeah, when Butch comes home, you know how the old school Bronx was, you know, when Butch comes home, you know, and, and Butch, when he came home, he didn't really want a piece, but Case had set up this whole thing you know, through me, we got Scene involved. Scene had massive paint. Agent used to have massive amounts of paint because Case was like, if y'all going to piece with me, y'all got to bring paint. And I'm like, I'm not giving this dude no paint, you know. <laughs> but Scene had massive amount of paint. So he was like, so that, what Was that that night that we all went to Gun Hill Road? Me, you, Kaz, uh -huh. Shy. Butch that was later. Case. That was that later. Was, that was later. The first piece we did with Butch was in the sixth tunnel where um where Richie with where um you know big scene, you know me and me and Richie did a piece, and it was a case and Butch, and then me and um little Corrado did a piece. So it's a fade, Corrado, Butch case, Butch drew the witch, on the side, and then oh me that's and, right yeah that's right I know that whole car. Yeah. yeah, and then Richie did a piece, and Richie drew like a, uh, That's right. a Superman. I think he drew Superman or some kind of character, some kind of character with his fist out with a cape. I think it was Superman, you know? So we did three carts that night. And then from there, Butch started getting the hang of it. And, you know, a couple of months later, a year later, that's when we got with you guys. And we did, I think it was like six carts at Gun Hill Road. Yeah, yeah. And T-Connection was downstairs bumping. Bump and, in. And uh, I always say that was a legendary night for, for graffiti. Yes. For style masters. Yes. Uh, you know, when we talk about that era of style writing and TMT and TBS being the dominant crew, mm. um, respectfully so, but I, we were all chasing and following and wanting to be as good as those guys. Yeah, And, and that lineup. I mean, it was incredible. That was incredible. Just, just to, just so, so that people understand, you know, writers our age, who uh, were too young to really be around Butch and Case, 
uh, and Riff and, and Kindo and those guys who were creating their legacy, that they were like mythical. They were like superstars yes. for us. Yes. And then to finally like paint with Case uh, is, am is amazing. Man, yeah. So, yeah. So tell me about this experience with him because he, he imparted a lot of style to you and, and, and philosophy because he had his own theory about style writing yeah. that I think only people like you can really know better than, than most. Case was, was intricate. You know, he, he believed in himself, you know, despite uh, what other people might could view as, you know, not having an arm and also not having a leg. He didn't have a leg also, you know. A lot right. of people didn't, didn't know that, you know. But, you know, I slept over his house a couple of times and, you know, I woke up and I'm looking, I'm like, dude, why is there a leg in the corner? Like, and he was like, oh, no, I, my leg got fried also, you know, and it looked like a, like a pencil you know, like a number two pencil or something. And, then, and I was like, wow, you're, you're a great person. Like, this doesn't affect you in any way. So his mind was like, like, like supreme, like, su like, you know, back in the days, you know, we were five percent or so. It was just so natural to, to like, oh yeah, you're, you're connected to a supreme being, you know, like you, you are who you say that you are, kid, like according to what you believe in. And and he was a, a you know, great teacher, great friend, great um, you know, you can confide in him. And he was definitely a great encourager and he was a visionary, you know, because when scene came on, you know, when little scene came, you know, wet me, Q and, and didn't really accept him. You know, Case uh, Case just embraced him totally, and it, it was just weird because you know the the first crew I'm running with doesn't accept my best friend, and then Case is like, "Yo," so you know they pulled out some amazing cards too. So Case was always a visionary, always you know his motto was "Each one teach one." You know he was purely Harlem Bronx. You know he was a mythical. You know, he I, man, mythical, lyrical, yeah, okay, lyrical, and all of that. Like he was hip hop. He was actually hip hop. You know, he would break dance. You know, on the one leg, he would, um, he would DJ. He could DJ. He can rhyme his behind off. You know, he used to call himself KC to the highest degree. Um, he was hip hop, man. He was hip hop, but his love for the, for the art was was even more in his love for artists. Like he loved you. He loved, you know, he loved Dondi. He loved everybody who was doing it with passion, you know? Yeah, I had the pleasure to paint with him a bunch. And, and again, wow. you know, part of, part of the thing that I always found was that, um, like you said, you know, it was this kind of, um, you know, trust with him, but also that, yeah, he is this, as you say, hip hop, he embodies all of this that you believe. And for you, when you start thinking about the trains, right, and, and you're getting up, you, you, you are now, you know, at art and design, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to graduate, what's going to happen next? Am I going to continue painting trains? What's, you know, what's next for me? What's... I mean, I, I, was, I was about to opt out. You know, I said, well, you know, this is because I, I saw my brother do it and then he just moved on with his life, you know. So I felt that was the natural thing to do, you know. But, you know, art and design was different. You know, I was around so many electrifying artists, you know, Chino Malo and Days, you know, they, they, those are guys that were super influential. You know, Days got me to change my name from Phase 3 to Fade, you know. And that happened in 77 in art and design, you know, and, but I never got a chance to peace with them. So it was kind of cool when I formed my own crew and, and, and then got with Case. When I got with Case, that put the stamp. So, you know, I'm like, okay, what am I going to, you know, do now? You know, I, I went to school for like two years in Brooklyn and, you know, took up art and advertising you know, then I, I, I tried hustling, got in a little bit of trouble, you know, 
and with the the hustle part it drove me to say i don't want the streets at all and it drove me down south it drove me to savannah college of art and design and you know i started taking up film production there and while i was going to school a year later you know sound seven who who was one of my students at the time too you know he said you taught me how to paint i'm gonna put something in your hand and he put the airbrush in my hand and uh you know i did my first shirt at his house and he said yo you're gonna be good and he hooked me up with a compressor you know i really wasn't really interested like that i was like, ah, i mean you know it's like painting on a train like why would not be you know cool doing some bubble letters and, and a character you know but he was like nah you're gonna be good you're gonna be good and he he basically you know gave me the setup if he wouldn't have gave me the setup i wouldn't have pursued it you know and he did that and like that voice right there is like my second shirt the one the first shirt it was for my mom's. It was roses. The second shirt is the one that's behind it, which was a um. I drew this guy's uh Formula One. I drew his um his car for him, and it was a guy that worked for my mother. I mean, he worked at the job with my mother, and he ordered the shirt and loved it, and that gave me the confidence to kind of like, okay, I'm selling. I can sell. I can do this. You know, and. I believe that, that the art saved my life. I was shying away from it, mind you. You know, when I met Serge, I didn't want to draw or paint anymore. You know, that's ninth grade. You know, uh, with the with the writing, by the time I was in 12th grade, I didn't want to do that anymore. But the airbrush kind of meshed all those worlds together, you know? Yeah, and it, and it brought you, you know, a different kind of get up, a different kind of fame. Um, especially, uh, you know, in the hip hop community. I mean, you were talking, you were painting for your community. Um, you were, you, you know, the streets were were talking, as we say, right? Yes. And yeah. and and so you started seeing, you know, the opportunity to enterprise. So, so tell me about that, about forming the short the shirt kings, and then thinking, okay, we're going after a market. We're a business now. Well, you gotta push back to push forward. Once again, art and design was pivotal. You know, I met I met my 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 shirt king partners in art and design. You know, Nike was um, from Marcy Projects, and he was in the in the cartooning. You know, Kashim was into cartooning. You know, and I was the I guess the resident you know graph writer, and we maintained our friendship. You know, through the years, through those years, I was hanging out in Marcy. You know, and. There's times I just wasn't making it home, you know? And I, I thank God that my mother kind of understood, like, I'm in Marcy. I'm not leaving here at 12 at night to get on some train to come up to the Bronx. I'm staying in Marcy. You know, with Kashim, it was like, he lived in Southside, Jamaica, Queens, across the street from, from 40 projects. So it's like, I'm getting all these experiences. Like, wow, you know? So I'm, we're all staying at Kashim's crib, you know, because it's a long walk from his house to the train station, you know, and we were walking at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I met these guys at A&D and ironically, they were doing something else and I was just pushing forward with the art, pushing forward, you know? And uh, my first shirt was for Larry Love from Grandmaster Flash. And so when I seen him in concert wearing the t-shirt, you know, pop locking and gliding across the stage, I said, man, I think I got something here. Like, this is going to go good with, with artists, you know, with, with, with entertainers, you know. And uh, so I just kept doing it until another art and design alumni, Daryl Ferguson, which is uh, ASAP Ferg's dad, he was actually my first t-shirt partner so we were in Harlem like doing t-shirts and there and he suggested that I go find my two partners you know and um I went and I went to Marcy looking for Nike and Kashim found Kashim found myself in Queens showing him what to do and he just pretty much said you know what you know I know Jam Master Jay 
and Kashim set that in motion. He set up a meeting with Jay, and we walked to Hollis, Queens, knocked on Jay's door. You know, I'm just like a little kid with T-shirts in my hand showing him my work. And Jam Master Jay, you know, 85, he's on top of the world. That's you know? right. Yes. The number one group in the, you know, across the pop charts, everything. And I'm sitting there, like, looking at him. He's looking at me, and he's like, who are you? You know? And I'm like, I'm fake, you know? And I like what he did, because he said, Kashim, if you get down with this, I'll finance you guys. So Jay forced Kashim to learn how to airbrush, you know? I was teaching him, but he was like, I don't, you know, he wasn't really grasping it, but when Jay stamped, you know, when you get that stamp from a freaking superstar like Jam Master J, who was also born in the same day as me and Nike, you know, ironically, you know, what can you do? You not you got to walk into your destiny. And he was like, go to the Ave. And, you know, we went. We went to the Ave and we found the Coliseum. And then Nike came along a little bit later. And then he was hand painting first. And then he then he began to, you know, pick up the airbrush. Nice. And of course, you would gain popularity through, you know, all these celebrities. Clients. And you get that the clients, you know, infamously, the audio too. Uh, what can I say? Top villain. You know, it, it, it's interesting because it you started becoming kind of the signature look and fashion in fashion for a while. And um, LL embraced you. And that was huge, too. That was huge. Well, we became the uniform. You know, every genre looks for a uniform. Like, you know, like I said before, the first hip hoppers were wearing leather and spikes, you know, because they wanted to be rockers. So we were all still looking for our, our identity. And I believe, you know, the airbrush wear created an identity for the, uh, um, for that, that, that part of hip hop, you know, the golden era. It created that for the golden era of hip hop. Yeah, and it also, you know, the 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 one thing that that you know, think about this at that time, there weren't any black fashion designers. Maybe Willie Willie Wear possibly was one of them. Um, there weren't many, and especially for urban wear, that didn't even exist. We were we were buying Lees, Levi's, Sassons, Jordache, whatever was was out there at the time. Um, but then there was the alternative. There was you. And it was Dapper Dan. Dapper Dan. And uh, he's had a tremendous comeback and recognition for his contribution to fashion and culture, just like you are, too. But you're also tied into his story. Let's talk about that. How did you guys meet um, and, and coll collaborate? Well, the mentality that, that I had growing up in the Bronx is like I treated the Shirt Kings like it was... Like, uh, if you knew anything about, like, what the rosters used to do back in the days, they used to open up herb gates everywhere. So I felt to move from different boroughs and pop open the shop, you know, in different boroughs and, and then start going down south. And, you know, we popped open the Shirt Kings in Atlanta, you know, Virginia, Miami, you know, just like all over and was teaching different artists, you know, how, how to prosper. You know, so I popped open a shop across the street from um, the Apollo Theater on 125th Street. And one day that came to me like I oh, I knew him, but I didn't know him. And I would hear of his tremendous feats of what he was doing with his clothes. And he came to 125th Street one day and he was like, you know, I had to come over here. I need to shake your hand. I was like, right, what's up? And he was like, well, basically, the customers that I'm servicing come to you. He said, you should consider me and you, you know, getting together and, you know, doing something. Then he, you know, he asked me some personal questions. He was like, you know, how much you paying rent here and this and that. And I told him. And so he turned around and was like, you know what? He said, just come down here and come check out my store. So I left and we walked down there. I saw the space that he had. And um, from there, we just built an amazing friendship. I shut down my spot and I went in with Dapper Dan and... I went from Harlem to everywhere, like all over with Dapper Dan, you know? And this was an important period because, again, that's part of 
part of the hustle that he was saying is like about creative and uh, economic empowerment, right? Yes. It's like, it's like I, you you, you want to own your own work. You want to yes. you want to profit from your own work. Yes. The thing the thing with with that, he was just the same way like Case. Like, you know, he had me as a liaison to the younger generation. You know. The younger generation were coming to buy from him, and then where they were speaking of the shirt kings, you know, uh, but there were people that, because of Harlem's notoriety at the time, they weren't they weren't coming up there, you know, and me being planted, also still in Queens, you know, I had access to people, you know, I brought Kwame up there, who was also an art and design alumni, and all that polka dot stuff that did it for him, you know. Uh, I brought a couple of people from Queens to, to Dapper Dan. I brought Jay-Z and jazz to Dapper Dan and, you know, their first time, you know, so definitely have the gift of, of connecting people, you know? Um, it's amazing your story already at this point, the arc of your contribution, both in graffiti, but also to streetwear, to fashion, to, 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 to the culture, everybody who's anybody. Here we have a picture of Flav of Flav. Yeah. Um, and uh, out of Chicago. So, t so tell me about these, this relationship with you and, and the rappers. Have you maintained that relationship or, or was it just client based? No, they, they, were, they were friendships. You know, growing up in New York and, and, you know, when you're going to high school, you visit other high schools, you know, you visit your family who might be going to printing or to music and art. You know, you just you just make your rounds. So a lot of a lot of the, these rappers, you know, from the golden era, I knew them personally. You know, like one of one of our homies from Marcy Projects was going to music and art. So we were going to music and art parties. So we were seeing Just Dice. We were seeing Dana Dane. We you know we were seeing Slick Rick. You know, we were seeing the original Gucci man. You know, we seen them really get down. And then I would see them at, at like Broadway International, uptown on 145th Street, you know, and, and things like that. So it was most of my clients, even till this day, it's more relational. You know, even like the, the young rappers that I deal with today, it's more relational. We sit down, we talk, we get, and then we always find some kind of common ground. You know, and it makes the job easier. You know, it makes a better connection, you know, and then it keeps me more exclusive because not everybody can just sit down with me, but people can, you know, just like how I did the case, like you, you boom, and, and it clicks in cases like, you know what, shorty, I'm going to do you an outline. You know what I'm saying? You got to have something that you're going to, you know, bring that the next person is going to pick up on, you know? Well, you left this amazing legacy and you've published the book with Alan Cat. Yes. Um, and I think this is Document Press, correct? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, this, this is a very rare book. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to find, actually. I think we have some at the museum shop. Yeah. But uh, I, I think this, this is a great book because it, it also tells a story, illustrates the story of, of the kind of impact you were having um, in the rap community, especially. You got, you got to note that this book was actually created by five graph writers. You know, the two publishers are from Sweet and then their graph writers. Alan Kett is a graph writer. I'm a graph writer. And then Noah, you know, who, who cleaned up the pictures and, and, you know, put it together, He's Noah TFP, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. this is the first of its kind, you know, that artists have come together from different genres and, and, and you know, different worlds and different, different sides countries, of the world, for sure. Countries and produce this, this amazing, you know, piece of document. And so, is, 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 do you intend of having a follow up, uh, Short Kings 2? Oh, definitely. I, I got thousands of photos I've been taking since the 70s. So, you know, it it has to has to go down. It has to go down. Plus, with this new generation 
of you know creators you know you just got to show that it, it keeps going it keeps going and and you know the yeah. stuff that 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 I've been doing today you know it it makes sense it's all still all relational you know working with with alchemists in Miami you know working with grimy wear out in Spain champion Star Wars, yes. you know. Yeah, you have you have you have a lot of a lot of good commercial work you've done over the years. So what I want to do, Fade, um, in this in this final moments, because uh, this there's this we're gonna do a part two. Uh, I'm gonna sign off and sign back on, folks, so that we can do the uh, the rest of the interview because there's more that where I'll pick up where you were just talking about okay. these other projects, these commercial projects you've been doing. Um, and again, folks, this is the Museum of Graffiti Artists Talk Live program. Uh, we're joined with t the, the, the fabulous and the legendary Shirt King Fade. Um, and so we stay posted. I'm just going to save the video and um, be right back. Yeah.